which the stalwart Muslim stood regarding him. Then, as if drawn by that persistent scrutiny, he raised his dull, weary eyes. At once they quickened. The dullness passed out of them. They were bright and keen as of old. He thrust his head forward, staring in his turn. Then, in a bewildered way, he looked about him at the ocean of swarthy faces under turbans of all colors, and back again at Sakr el Bayer. God's light, he said at last in English, to vent his infinite amazement. Then, reverting to the cynical manner that he had ever affected, and effacing all surprise, Good day to you, Sir Oliver, said he. I suppose you'll give yourself the pleasure of hanging me. Allah is great, said Sakr el Bayard impassively. End of section 9, read by Dennis Sayers in Modesto, California, for LibriVox, summer 2006. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Seahawk by Raphael Sabatini. Part 2, Chapter 2. The Renegade. How it came to happen that Sakr el Bar, the hawk of the sea, the Muslim rover, the scourge of the Mediterranean, the terror of Christians, and the beloved of Assad ed din Basha of Algiers, would be one and the same as Sir Oliver Tresillian, the Cornish gentleman of Pinaro, is at long length set forth in the chronicles of Lord Henry Goad. His lordship conveys to us some notion of how utterly overwhelming he found that fact by the tedious minuteness with which he follows step by step this extraordinary metamorphosis he devotes to it two entire volumes of those eighteen which he has left us. The whole, however, may with advantage be summarized into one short chapter. Sir Oliver was one of a score of men who were rescued from the sea by the crew of the Spanish vessel that had sunk the Swallow. Another was Jasper Lee, the skipper. All of them were carried to Lisbon, and there handed over to the court of the Holy Office. Since they were heretics all, or nearly all, it was fit and proper that the brethren of St. Dominic should undertake their conversion in the first place. Sir Oliver came of a family that never had been famed for rigidity in religious matters, and he was certainly not going to burn alive if the adoption of other men's opinions upon an extremely hypothetical future state would suffice to save him from the state. He accepted Catholic baptism with an almost contemptuous indifference. As for Jasper Lee, it will be conceived that the elasticity of the skipper's conscience was no less than Sir Oliver's, and he was certainly not the man to be roasted for a trifle of faith. No doubt there would be great rejoicings in the Holy House over the rescue of these two unfortunate souls from the certain perdition that had awaited them. It followed that as converts to the faith they were warmly cherished, and tears of thanksgiving were profusely shed over them by the hounds of God. So much for their heresy. They were completely purged of it, having done penance in proper form at an alto held on the Rosia at Lisbon, candle in hand and San Benito on their shoulders. The church dismissed them with her blessing and an injunction to persevere in the ways of salvation to which such meek kindness she had inducted them. Now this dismissal amounted to a rejection. They were, as a consequence, thrown back upon the secular authorities, and the secular authorities had yet to punish them for their offenses upon the seas. No offense could be proved, it is true, but the courts were satisfied that this lack of offense was but the natural result of a lack of opportunity. Conversely, they reasoned, it was not to be doubted that with the opportunity the offense would have been forthcoming. Their assurance of this was based upon the fact that when the Spaniard fired across the bows of the Swallow as an invitation to heave to, she had kept upon her course. Thus, with unanswerable Castilian logic, was the evil...